Thank you, Josh. Um, so my name is Jose Juan Lara Jr. and I'm joined by Leo Martinez. <laughs> and we're both project coordinators for the National Latina Network, a project of Casa Esperanza. Um, so let's just get into this. Um, so Casa Esperanza, for some of you who are not familiar, um, our mission is focused around mobilizing Latino communities to end domestic violence uh, through our five core values, which is Latina leadership, entrepreneurship, organizational excellence, living free of violence, and community-driven solutions. Um, and as part of that philosophy is we strongly believe that um, community um, is the response to ending domestic violence to any system or organization. Um, we also emphasize that developing social capital, trust, recipro reciprocity, information, cooperation, because we believe it decreases domestic violence. As part of that, um, the National Latina Network is a project of Casa Esperanza that is working at ending violence and promoting health and well-being in Latino communities around the country. Um, and so we're also acknowledged as one of the cultural, culturally specific resource centers under the Office on Violence Against Women, of course, within the context of the, uh, Latino communities. We have three main areas of focus, which is public policy, research, training, and technical assistance. We have staff as part of the national network all over the country. Um, and if folks are interested in, part in joining, um, receiving updates on public policy that impacts Latino communities, anything around research that impacts Latino communities, or uh, more information on training and technical assistance, you can join our listserv at um, uh, national Latina network dot org. So, um, Leo. Sure. And uh, good good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, if you are like me in Atlanta or some other part of the country. And uh, as just I um, wanted to uh, give you a, um, an overview of the objectives of the training, really quick, and uh, some of those as looking at some broad concepts of male privilege and how they are interpreted or validated in different communities, uh, maybe differentiate between prevention and intervention models and um, community engagement and outreach and how that's affect the work that we do and how it presents itself uh, in, through different models and provide resources and programs that have implemented cultural specific services for men and male identified persons. So we'll be talking about some examples that we have worked on a uh, the program that we have uh, at Casa Esperanza. So next we need to, uh, we were in the, trying to get a, an idea of um, your organizations and the work that you do. Uh, we'll have a, a couple of questions coming up. The first one is, are there any men or male identified persons in your organization? So this is just a, a yes, no answer. And also, if you, uh, if you don't mind, uh, you can also uh, put the, the, the positions that maybe this uh, male, uh, men or male, male identified uh, individuals in your organization hold uh, in the chat box. Uh, that would be fine. If you have a few minutes, just type them there. We're just trying to get a, um, an idea of a, um, uh, you know, who who is involved in your organization and what type of work you're doing and the programming that you maybe have. You may be a, um, uh, already experts with this work and we definitely would like to hear from you too if uh, if you do have any kind of program right now uh, engaging men or engaging Latino men in your communities. So we'll see. And, okay, so we have... <laughs> just men in general, yes. And so we have, okay, so there's 78% um, uh, have said that there's men or male identified persons in the organization and 22% no. So let's move on to the next question. And it is, does your organization have initiatives that engage nonviolent men, male identified persons? And that's just a, a yes or no question.
We've got about 60% of people who have responded. Going to give just another couple of seconds to let a few other people answer. Sure. So let's let's get those answers in and we'll see what the percentages are. All right, so it's at 47 percent versus 53 percent and we can move on to the to the last question and that's just, just to to have an idea um, and I see already that there's a difference between the um, the um, you know the programs that have a um, male involvement in your organizations but also uh, that there is a difference with the um, programming so that's the organization have a specific programming for men male identified survivors and we'll give this a, a couple of minutes to see if I, um, we can get an idea All righty, so 89% said no. All righty, so, so yes, I see um, based on the on these answers that there is, a, even though there is men involved in the organizations that you guys work that have, we still have a, um, you know, a gap on, on providing a, um, or sometimes it's because of funding, sometimes it's for, Many other reasons that a um, that we don't have programming a um, directed at men or male identified survivors, or that we engage a nonviolent a um, what is a male or male identified a, uh, individuals, and uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good to know as as we move forward into this a um, into this a uh, webinar. The next a um, the next slide we are going to a, um, a uh, the idea is that we work. Uh, and I think I don't know if you mentioned a um, Jose Juan about the idea that we don't uh, work with a um, from a uh, heteronormative type of a um, uh, of lens. So with our our lens is going to be more a, a intersectional, and that will include what is a gender, age, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, physical abilities, qualities, and everything that you can think of of individuals that may have as as, as identities and intersect. Uh, and that's the way that we work at the, the National Latino Network, Casa Esperanza. And I hope that you I, um, also do a, um, in your organizations. Let's move on to right. the uh, and next. Yeah. Yeah, so, so and if folks noticed in the title of the, of the webinar, we intentionally put men, male identified persons, because I think sometimes we forget, it becomes this very heteronormative concept, and a lot of times we'll talk more, more about programming, um, and sometimes it just becomes this definition of what is a man versus what is not a man, or someone who may be male identifying, so just keeping that uh, perspective uh, as part of this engaging in this conversation for today. So, um, so <laughs> the question is, and if can, people can just put their answers in the chat box, you know, why engage men or male identified persons in addressing gender-based violence? And I think this is probably the big, broad question, but if can folks just type in the chat box, um, why do you think it's important um, that we should engage men or male identified persons in addressing gender-based violence. And again, we ask this question because I, we don't want to assume people's reasoning or idea as to why, so if people could write some of that, you know, give their um, reasons or assumptions. Josh, if you can tell me or Leo what, what folks are typing, because I don't have access to that. Um, I don't see any 
any responses? And I don't know if I'm looking at the right place, but. We just had one pop in and it says the majority of offenders have historically been men male identified. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And it seems like um, most of the programming, especially around responding to, uh, let's say, domestic violence or family violence, a lot of the programming we do have around engaging men is from the um, intervention for uh, and prevention for bat with batterers who use violence. Um, what else? Anyone else? One person says shame. Okay. And that's all at this time. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, those are very interesting responses for sure. Um, and I don't want to assume what shame means for that person that put that response, um, because that could mean so many things. Um, but again, there's there's so many reasons why we shouldn't engage men, but then there's also reasons perhaps as to why we don't. Um, and why is that that is an, either as an organization, what are some of the barriers for us to do that as an organization? And again, we'll also be, we will also be talking about how to engage men who have not engaged in violence in their relationships or don't use violence in their relationships. So I have some clarification um, from that person that yep. said shame. And they said to avoid men feeling ashamed. Uh, and then we had a few other responses come through. One says problem facing all of society. Another one says a lot mm -hmm. of the time it is focused as a woman's issue. I think it would be important to include men because it is both genders together. Um, it would be more effective. Another person says, because men male identified persons experience stigma concerning gender-based violence and are often left out of the narrative of victimization, they are often viewed from the lens of perpetrator offender and that uh, perpetuates silence. Right, right. Oh, well, thank you for that clarification. Um, so again, um, just going again, this question is very broad, um, but it, I think part of, part of it is also understanding why each one of us from our different organizations or different uh, professional experiences, why we want to do this, you know, and thank you for sharing those responses. So um, a lot of times we have to look at intersecting factors around why we should engage or could engage men or male identified persons in the work that we do against gender based violence. Um, as some of you have already mentioned, you know, knowledge attitudes about use of gender based violence. Uh, cultural norms, gender norms, integration and transmission of violence. As we know, violence is something that we often may learn. It doesn't mean we often in, in, uh, engage in it, but definitely um, if we're just talking from the perspective of male socialization, it seems that as men or as male identified, there's this expectation of us being more physically aggressive and often um, responding or answering to problems through a physical act, and sometimes that could be aggressive. It could also become a physical act of violence. Um, and so there's many ways of why we are, we are addressing this question today and how do we engage. And you notice that we use the word engage uh, because this is an ongoing conversation. And the evolution of engaging men or male identified people in the work around ending uh, or trying to end gender-based violence it evolves throughout time. And again, gender norms or cultural expectations also shift through time. Um, certainly, um, an example of that is now we women are working. People, women have uh, have been professionals, have been in the field. You know, they're doctors or lawyers. Um, you know, very prominent positions of employment. But there's still some existence of a double standards around gender. Right? Um, we still have the expectation of this glass ceiling that we know that women make less on the dollar than men do. Um, and so it goes back to attitudes about gender and the value that we put in the work of each uh, gender identity or expression, in this case, um, very uh, binary of either male or female, men or women, or female identified or male identified. Um, 
And I, I know I'm using a lot of terminology, but I'm trying to be as inclusive and comprehensive when we're talking about when we engage specifically men or male identified persons in the work that we do. Um, so again, these are trends and attitudes that shift through time depending on the generation, but sometimes some things just still remain the same um, in the work that we do around uh, trying to end gender-based violence. Leo, do you have anything else to add to this? Yeah, I, then you just mentioned actually the uh, cultural norms, gender norms, with a uh, tend to be similar across cultures. So uh, it's not that we are the, um, identifying just specific cultures that they um, may have different cultural norms or gender norms. For the most part, rigid gender roles are a, um, in all cultures, and and that's the name what we're talking about in the next slide. If you can, uh, yeah, the question uh, posed is, how does uh, rigid gender roles become a barrier to invite and create access to engage men and male-identified allies? And, and this is, you know, the rigid gender roles that, that we teach our children since they're little, um, that, you know, separating by colors or, those, you know, boys uh, wear blue, uh, girls uh, wear pink or, or or things, you know, like, you know, when you were talking about a, um, uh, you know, um, uh, teaching our children are, are, are the boys to be more, uh, what is more violent, like, oh, why should stand up for themselves? You know, that kind of, that kind of a, um, a, uh, what is socialization that we do with boys different than we do with girls. And what it does is that it just creates this, a, uh, um, these problems down the road as we grow up that <laughs> it becomes a, uh, what is a, uh, or is a, uh, a sexual violence or domestic violence or homophobia or transphobia, all those stem from those type of things. I used to uh, um, work in a program called Caminar Latino in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and we used to do with, with a, uh, a youth program. A, um, I, I had a, a group of uh, eight to 11 year olds, and we had an activity that we used to do all the time, uh, you know, every once in a while, and we, uh, uh, about types of families. So we, she was, we, uh, would show pictures to the children about, you know, what they would consider a family. So we would show, you know, big extended families or intersectional couples with children, what is it, interracial couples with children, or a, um, a, a single moms with children, single dads with children, gay couples with children, lesbian couples with children. And for the most part, everyone was a family except for the, um, you know, which we always expected for, um, most kids to say the uh, the lesbian couples and the gay couples that was not a family and also uh, single moms single moms with children for children that was not a family so that kind of shows you how a um how deep and rooted is a uh, these ideas of rigid gender roles that we give is like that a single mom cannot be a family how does that come to be so it is because of these gender roles and what we teach our children since little so then we shouldn't be surprised that it would be harder also to invite a, a man because we're telling them since they're kids, oh, men are not supposed to have feelings. Men don't talk things through. And then now we want them to come to the table and, <laughs> and be part of this, uh, of this conversation. So we have to start early on and maybe with youth programs uh, about how you know, we need to change the idea and those ideas of masculinity, which I think is the next idea. Uh, slide if you um, don't mind forward a um, other one. Right. So, um, so again, um, like Leo already mentioned, a lot of these things filter through the work that we do in trying to invite, not only invite, but also engage men or male identified uh, persons into the work that we do. Um, and again, we're all impacted by these forms of idea of masculinity masculinity. And then if you really are um, using an approach from an intersectional lens, you also have to include for how different uh, ethnic and racial communities ide uh, define masculinity. Um, and may not, it might not be congruent with our ideas and it might clash with what our ideas of what is um, the role of men and women or male identified or female identified. Um, and so again, it, it bears repeating that all of these become intersecting isms. Because um, it's not just about uh, talking around gender-based violence from the role of just gender, 
but if we're going to use a intersectional framework, it's also talking about how um, racial and ethnic identity impacts that perception of masculinity. Uh, social economic status in, impacts that ideas of masculinity. Um, the way we dress, um, certainly, um, you know, for women, and I'm just talking this term on binary about women and men, women have more fluidity in their way they dress. Women can wear pants um, as opposed to some men. If some men wear dresses, uh, you know, they're gonna, we're going to be looked at kind of funny. Um, not, not a kilt. But address um, so all these things, right? And again, looking at the intersections of isms, and not just looking at it from gender, but also from all these other layers, because people don't just come. You know, we're not just one, um, one just one layer, one facet of our lives. We we bring in all these different identities, different layers to our identity, um, and then some of us who are who identify as male uh, or man or male identity. You know, we some of us don't fit that expression. We don't fit that uh, idea or ideal of masculinity, which is strong, fast, assertive, aggressive. Um, you know, super physically imposing on others. I certainly don't. Uh, I don't think I, I um, for the most part, fit those uh, ideas of masculinity. But at the same time, I have to acknowledge that I do benefit from the privilege of male being identified as a man or a male. Um, so again, just looking at that and then also looking as an organization, how is male privilege played out in your organization? Because male privilege also impacts um, women in many, in different ways. Um, but so again, just this idea of masculinity, Leo? Yeah, I think you're muted because we can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I was muted. So I agree. Yes, all these uh, intersecting identities that do affect how the uh, the ideas of masculinity that we carry, and sometimes it's not the ones that we want, but we have to uh, um, break with those maybe later in life or as we get more enlightened. So, uh, so it is a, an ongoing work, even for 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 everyone. Right. And it's also, again, if you're adding the extra layer of cultural expectations of masculinity, we're not saying that those are wrong either. Um, sometimes, you know, we really are using culturally responsive approaches is that we as organizations or representatives of organizations need to adapt to that idea of, of what that community thinks is masculine or, or yeah. appropriate for a male identified person. Um, and again, it sometimes may be challenging. But we again, if we're going to be culturally responsive, we have to kind of try to have engagement around that dialogue as to why um, certain roles around gender have these expectations. Yeah, we just we just got to be careful only about not making blanket statements or generalizations based on different particular cultures. Which kind of leads us to our next slide around you know our own perceptions of the other or other communities. You know, racial ethnic identity plus gender equals stereotypes. Um, and so there, you know, we all have different stereotypes of the other. Um, you know, uh, for example, you know, I know that there's a lot of stereotypes and I've grown with these stereotypes around Latino men that we are hyper masculine, we have multiple sexual partners. Uh, we are violent and all of these things. And so, again, if you have this extra, uh, I mean, this approach around intersections, uh, intersectional work, we also know that particularly, and I'm talking for just men of color, we already come with these, with, with this baggage of us being all these things, you know, black and brown men. We're violent, we're, we're, uh, promiscuous. All of these things. So again, this again, as an organization or representatives of different organizations, we need to be very aware around our isms around racial and ethnic identity plus gender, and then what are these stereotypes that play in? Because that could be actually the barrier that is preventing your organization from engaging men or male identified folks, not just from the 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 uh, identity of being. Uh, the gender identity of being male or, or man, or a man, but also the stereotypes that it becomes around 
all of those things, especially if you're a man or a person of color, uh, male identified. Leo? No, I, um, I agree with that. And, and if we move to the next slide, actually you see that something that we um, hear often in, in Latino culture and also in other, even this word translate to a, um, a, uh, all cultures that people use it as machismo. And what is a, uh, and all it is is just male privilege or using patriarchal um, system values. And we just, a, um, we want to a, uh, caution everybody about using the word machismo. We're parting away from using this because it actually just implies that, well, if it's a Spanish word, it comes from, you know, Latino cultures, so Latino cultures are machistas, but that's not, that's not the case. So that's when I was talking about making these blanket statements. It's like, let's, let's get away from using words like this. And right. if you see that, also, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, and so I, I'm also, uh, have a complicated relationship with this term, um, because I also, um, when I hear folks, like Leo said, folks outside of Latino communities use this term, you have to really pause and say, why are you using this term? Um, because there are certain terms that just are part of the community and they carry so much stigma and stereotypes and folks use it. And also for those of us who are um, participating in this webinar, who are maybe identified as part of the Latino communities, also I would caution you when you use the term machismo when you're doing trainings or presentation, because that could trigger a lot of these stereotypes inadvertently in the in the training. So be very mindful as to why you use the word. Instead of using machismo, just use male privilege. That would be my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also what is say, oh, patriarchal value systems, that's similar things. And if you see, if you can move to the next slide, uh, here's an example of a, um, how a um, male privilege or patriarchal value systems are permeates all cultures. Here's an example of a, a couple of years ago, I think, of a um, Kirk Cameron that was in prominent in the news for a little while about the way that he perceives that a, um, you know, a, um, his wife should be, uh, behave and he should behave within the, the marriage. And it, it was like very, very patriarchal type of a uh, relationship that, that he, and uh, actually almost in the borderline abusive based on what he was a, uh, um, explaining. So, so we see that this happens in all cultures, and and sometimes it could be uh, uh, influenced by religion, but sometimes not. So, uh, yeah, and and also we have to be careful of that as well. So, and was there one? Yeah, and so and and along those lines of how language is so important, um, and how we use the uh, when we use certain words that are. are are attached strongly to certain communities, in this case, the word machismo or machista to Latino men or Latino communities, you know, we have to look at how this looks like, right? Um, and it's not to say that these representations um, are not true because like in any community, some some of these stereotypes, you know, or, or identities have become stereotypes. You know, I definitely have family that looks like in the picture on um, on your screen, which would be on your right hand side. But then there's also this stereotype of being uh, gang bangers, you know, criminals. And then you have the other picture on the other side of, of Ricky Martin. Before he came out, you know, he was this Latin lover, you know, the hot Latin lover, you know, uh, you know, his music and everything. And so these very polarizing images of male or masculinity within the context of Latino communities or Latino men or male identified uh, Latino persons. Um, and certainly we can say that of other uh, communities of men of color or male of co or male identified persons of color. So these, this is just to give you an example of how polarizing um, some of these terms can be. And, and uh, again, uh, my theory is if you grew up in, in, in or if you're part of the U, this construct of US culture, uh, and societal expectations are based on just gender norms and others and other things. Um, you know, we have whether subconsciously or or, unconscious, or uh, consciously these isms surface, and so we have these ideas of Latino men. And again, we're just, I'm just Leo and I are just using the um, 
men and male identified persons within the construct of Latino communities because that's where we identify with. But again, some of these things you can extrapolate um, and nuance it based on the community you're trying of, of men or male identified persons you're trying to engage. But again, these are the things that um, are the images that come up. And certainly, I don't fit neither. And sometimes I do at the same time, depending <laughs> the time of the day. If it's on the weekend and I'm kind of scraggly looking and I haven't shaved, there's going to be certain expectations and perceptions of me in a public space. Um, you know, and certainly. Um, it may be different when I'm doing a training, it may be not. So again, looking at gender roles and stereotypes and how it all intersects together, one is not separate from the other. Um, one is not more or less important than the other. Again, this is just part of using that intersectional framework when we're starting to consider to engage men or male identified persons in doing the work around gender-based violence. Well. I think you're muted again, Leo. Oh, okay. Yes, I am. But it's, what's our next slide? Let me see. Mm -hmm. It's about gender role and social expectations. And, and here's just an, some examples of a um, what a, um, sometimes we uh, create for ourselves, you know, the, the ideas of masculinity that we were talking earlier about. And um, what is the... Um, you know, like men up and face that you're a man and things like that. So, uh, um, and this is only uh, creates problems that, you know, that is rooted in the, um, in all the things that we mentioned earlier, like such as misogyny, sexism, heterosexism, homophobia, transphobia, all of that is a, um, the roots of gender based violence. And we uh, want to stay away from that. So, a, um, do you have anything else to say about this slide again, Jose Juan? Yeah, and then again, um, and I am guilty of prescribing to some of these um, images or social expectations, um, whether I'm supposed to commit, uh, uh, be that or not. Um, but again, this is also a very heteronormative perspective of man, because you know, man up. What does that mean? Um, what if you have you know, because you also have uh, women or female identified persons who do a lot of what stereotypically or typically have become man's job. You know, I have a friend who she's heterosexual. She's been married to her husband several years, has a child, but she's the one who manages the finances of the home. So technically, she's manning up to the job. So does that make her husband any less of a man, uh, any less of a responsible father? Uh, for some people, it may say yes. For some people, that's a comfortable notion. For some folks, it's not. But again, just that these very baseline reactions we have around gender expectations and social expectations, again, filter through the work that we do in trying to engage men um, or male identified persons in, against uh, to end gender based violence. Um, so, uh, and again, uh, Leo mentioned some of these, Leo. Yeah, no, I, and what, what this does is, a, um, over time, it gives a, um, males a, um, men permissions to actually act a certain way, uh, even though it's not, you know, <laughs> what we should, they, um, how we should they, um, express ourselves. But, you know, those permissions appear, and what is a, uh, and they're sort of over time like, oh, yes, that's okay. It's sort of like okay to to be violent in a certain way, even if it's subtle. And that's what I, uh, if you can move to the next slide, I, um, uh, Jose Juan. We need that's why we need to talk about collusion. So what is collusion? Anybody? Maybe we can. Maybe y'all can. And while people. Yeah, y'all that type. <clears throat> while yeah, people, any, any but, idea? in their answers for that question, we did have a question pop up and it says, I'm a sure. teacher in a middle school. I hear male teachers tell kids to man up. In your opinion, what is a professional way to address this? I'm sorry, could you, re could you repeat that question? Yes, it says, I'm a teacher in a middle school. I hear male teachers tell kids to man up. In your opinion, what is a professional way to address this? Definitely address it. 
but it's a um, we should have it, and I'm, that's what I was going to talk about a little bit. But a, uh, it's about this a, um, uh, zero tolerance to collusion attitude, and that's you know that's basically collusion when we allow others you know a, um, to allow any kind of violence to take place, no matter how subtle, and you know we do nothing about it. Uh, so you know we we need to, especially men, we need to a um, what do you say? Uh, become a little bit more of a uh, collusion police. You know, have a better understanding of how does this show up. What do you say? Um, how does a um, affects our lives? Because evidently, it affects our lives. Because if your a um, um, what is relationships are affected by violence, and somehow we, you know, they are being affected by by the messages that we receive, and that and by the message that we that that we uh, um, uh, support and the messages that we give out so so collusion is what we uh, need to stay away from and what we need to address so for example i worked in a um uh, for a year i had the opportunity to do a um uh, auditing for a um, batteries intervention programs and i um, move around the state observing uh, programs pretty much every day and i could see in those programs that a uh, you know how the, the the violence was showing up or how the collusion was showing up you know by comments that that the men in the in the groups were uh, given but the thing that that struck me the most about learning about that it was that most of the comments that the men uh, um, were making in those groups uh, um, are similar to the comments that people do on everyday lives and we tend to just uh, um, you know look the other way and say okay that's okay because our gender norms our gender uh, gender roles or what do you say uh, our rigid gender roles have allowed us or, or you know we allowed ourselves to to become that so so we have to be very careful and and try to stay away from from you know becoming more uh, giving ourselves permission to to collude um there are you know overt ways to to collude like for example maybe uh cat calling that would be an uh, overt way you know and maybe uh, for for even for for example gay men using the word the b word and and what do you say uh, and all the people around them not saying anything uh so so we have to uh, yeah, be more aware of how that happens and address it. And maybe in that particular uh, situation of the uh, of the teacher, maybe not do it right in front of the student, but maybe you have having conversations after, what is say, uh, with that person. If you don't want, uh, you know, uh, create something that maybe gets out of hand, out of hand there. But definitely we have to uh, address collusion. We cannot let it go. Otherwise, we just are, uh, um, well, it's just the um, part of the, the violence that occurs. And how do we address it? We just have to provide information about collusion. We need to let people know what, you know, that what what is violent and you know how it shows up, how it shows up. And we need to provide examples and we need to model it and set up expectations and stay true to a um, zero tolerance collusion attitude. So um right. And and I think part of that is this is where um, as ma as men or male identified persons as allies to people who don't identify as part of the male spectrum identity that where we need to stand up uh, because it it I, it <laughs> when and it's just, this is a complicated situation but when I hear men well I'm not like those men I don't use violence in my relationship I don't beat up my girlfriend I'm not like those men which is fine and great, but how are we as other men who don't use violence being addressing and calling each other out on that process? Um, there's certainly, there's a time and a place for everything, um, but I think as men or male identified persons who are allied to, allies to persons who don't identify as men or, or male, um, we have to call each other out. We have to hold each other accountable. And I think uh, there's different ways of doing that. Um, if you know that person as a friend, you just have to pull them aside. But it also takes a lot of courage to do that because I think um, for a lot of, and this is just my theory, for a lot of for a lot of us as men or male identified persons who don't challenge each other, another man or another male person, is because it also would be infringing on our own power as a man or a male. <laughs> um, and so I have to think about what is that all about with me. 
Um, and if I'm really a true ally to women or female identified persons, it's like, why am I challenged about calling out other men in the process? And um, definitely when I do that, I don't want to put other people in danger as well based on my uh, holding other people accountable, particularly other men or, ma or male identified persons accountable to what they're doing. Um, so I think it just depends on the situation. But again, I think as men or male identified persons, we really have to have an internal analysis as to why we are troubled by that um, and why we're not holding each other accountable more to the issue. Yeah, and and like you mentioned, when people say, well, no, I'm not a violent person. Well, if you ever laughed at a sexist joke, then you're sort of contributing to the violence. So, so that's, you know, how we have to look at those uh, yeah, subtleties. Right. And again, we have to also look at it from an intersexual framework uh, for, for men who use violence in their relationship or male identified persons who use violence in their relationships. Um, you know, um, it's part of a more bigger structural form of gender-based violence. Um, and again, not all men use violence, but at, again, at some level, like Leo said, if we remain silent, you know, are we also not part of the violence? Are we also not perpetuating violence, but just by seeing, by, by being a silent bystander to the problem or to the issue, to the concern? Um, and again, this is just an example of street harassment. You know, um, and we've seen those videos on YouTube or Facebook, you know, where you see some women walking around the streets are being harassed. And, you know, there's been some videos around some men that are being harassed. Um, in either case, it's not acceptable. It's not tolerable. But, you know, that statistic, you know, among men, 25% have been street harassed. A higher percentage of a lesbian, gay, bi, and trans identified men than heterosexual men reported this. And their most common form of harassment was homophobic or transphobic slurs. So again, going back to the issues around misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, and again, that's an organization that is contemplating and engaging men or identif male identified folks or persons. These are things you, you have to consider and start dialoguing internally. Because, um, you know, it's great. We want to do a men's group. But what does that mean and how does that change the culture? and the feeling of that organization who historically has served predominantly women, um, you know, all of that. So as part of that, um, trying to address um, uh, the question about how to engage men or male identified uh, individuals, uh, uh, the National Latina Network, Casa Esperanza, uh, did this uh, scan of the field uh, through the RISE project, um, uh, research integration and strategies ev evaluation. And so we focus particularly around uh, advanced, uh, the issue around how community-based solutions um, are being done to engage specifically Latino men and boys. Um, and then our part was also not just talking about Latino men and boys from a hetero centric context, but also including gay, bisexual, and transgender Latino men. And um, the report is already out, and we can definitely share that report with you all as part of the materials. So I just want, we wanted to share some of those findings that we did or we, or, uh, we discovered. Um, so for the most part, it seems like uh, most programming around engaging men or boys, just again from a hetero normative context is focusing on fatherhood, interpersonal relationships, and healthy sexuality. And that varies from organization to organization. Um, but it also kind of limits the role of men and boys to these three different areas, especially when you're just focusing from a heterosexual, heteronormative, or uh, very specific gender role or identity or expression. Um, but for the most part, this is what we discovered. Um, and so these are some of the organizations um, that kind of did more work in expanding that. And, and as I mentioned before, as part of our role in this scan of the field around programming around for men and boys around ending gender-based violence, we also reached out to um, 
organizations that focus within lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities of color or lesbian, gay, and bisexual, transgender communities. Um, and so you see some of these folks. Uh, Casa Esperanza, which is our organization, uh, we have a Tenvito tool, which we developed, and we'll talk more about that later. Mary Center um, has an innovative pro project where um, they actually do home visits for fathers. You know, a lot of times, a lot of these services around parenting is focused just on the mother, but Mary Center actually focused and developed a pro program that focuses on fathers, particularly single fathers who are raising children. And that's very rare, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, doing some, and that would be culturally responsive around that. Promundo is also an international organization that's done a lot of work around men globally, men from different parts of the world. Um, interpersonal relationships, enlace comunitario, um, uh, as um, Leo mentioned. Um, and they were actually, uh, Leo, correct me if I'm wrong or maybe confusing them, but I think they were one of the first organizations that actually started to incorporate um, as part of their batter's intervention programming to incorporate uh, women and also survivors um, of their partners of or, or, or survivors who were experiencing violence from their um, heterosexual male partners. Um, and it was very controversial at the point because they were talking about safety but then it was also being culture responsive and addressing the issue that, you know, within and, and one of the um, characteristics of Latino communities is that the family is very important and, it's some, and it's, it is at the center of community. And so there was some controversy around that, but it worked. Um, South Valley Mail is another project out of California. And they work with specifically with young boys, um, teenage boys. And they use art as part of uh, developing healthy relationships, not just within intimate and interpersonal relationships. It's not just within the dating context, but also within their family relationships. And then also as boys relating to other boys and using art. Um, the Peace Initiative is another uh, organization in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and it focuses and they have fatherhood initiatives. And again, from a very, uh, and again, just looking at interpersonal relationships from a fatherhood perspective and understanding that father, being a father is not just being a provider, but it has being also a loving parent. And then healthy sexuality. Um, this is where we spoke to, and these three, and these three organizations, In Our Own Voices, Survivors Pathways, Hispanic uh, Gay Black Men, actually that's the title of the organization, um, they focus around queer or lesbian, gay, bi, and trans communities of color um, and, you know, having developed um, very nuanced practices around healthy sexuality. Because, um, uh, again, a lot of these issues, uh, or a lot of the programming that focuses on just batter's intervention, they just focus on how to address the gender-based violence, but it's also a question of healthy sexuality practices. Um, and sometimes that's spoken in some of these uh, programs, sometimes it's not. Um, but as I mentioned before, we will definitely share the RISE report uh, so y'all can look at it and also a link to um, the RISE project. And there was other different reports done. There was a report focusing on, uh, I believe, Muslim communities, um, South Asian, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, I, and I realize that I've particularly been talking about men of color in this aspect. Um, but again, um, as, as a Latino, and then because we are Casa Esperanza and our main focus is around Latino communities, we also have to understand there's a lot of this other extra layer of racism happening within men of color, um, you know, and expectations around what that is. So again, these three, um, focuses around fatherhood, interpersonal relationships, and healthy sexuality, these specific programs have kind of built culturally responsive methods or techniques that addresses just uh, folks who identify as men or male-identified persons, of, of either adults, uh, youth, 
and then folks from a diverse spectrum of gender identity, which gay, bisexual, or transgender men. Um, and so um, part of the, of the research project or the scan of the field for the RISE project um, is about having critical analysis. And again, this is, these are things that um, as an organization that you're contemplating on engaging uh, men or male identified persons is look at what is the theory. So we looked at the guided, guided theoretical principles uh, of these um, programs because they also had a, a component of evidence-based research to their programming. Um, because we all know that if you don't have the evidence to back up your argument, then you don't have nothing. Um, and so a lot of these programs also as part of just, of not just only doing the programming, but they also had an evidence-based practice of collecting the data and al analyzing trends and all of those things. Also part of the, uh, uh, some of the other themes around these specific programs that we uh, looked at and, and spoke to some of the representatives of these programs is the collective healing that happens. Um, and again, um, you know, in Western concepts of masculinity, men are independent and strong and don't cry, but then it also may clash with the, uh, for some men who are part of uh, racial or ethnic communities where the collective process of healing is important. Um, it's not just you alone, right? But there's still some level of men being independent and men don't cry and all of these things. But again, you know, as men or male identified folks, we are a community and at just at that cultural identity. And so how do we collectively heal and using collective healing as part of that process around fatherhood, interpersonal relationships and healthy sexuality? Um, attending to participant urgent needs. Again, just like anyone else, if you're a parent, you know, you're concerned about, you know, shelter, food, clothing, and protecting your family. And then for some of those, for some men, for some of us men, those are very strongly attached to our identity as men or or, or a masculine identity. We cannot provide the family. We've kind of failed. And so, um, you know, some of these programs also had uh, job searches programming, you know, uh, looking for jobs and, you know, because again, for some of us, that's a strong part of our identity. If we're not providing for a family, we're not providing, we're failing as men or a, ma a male identified person. Flexibility also allowed these programs uh, adjusted the timing of their programming. Some of them, because, you know, some men work during the day, so they had most of the programming in the evenings. Um, also understanding that some of these men or male identified folks have families and other obligations, and so trying to be flexible. And then also being culturally responsive is also being flexible in how programming may shift in the middle of the project. Um, so some of us who receive grant funding uh, to do this kind of kind of work mainly from either a fatherhood programming or a batter's intervention programming. Also, we have to understand that those, uh, what we thought as our deliverables, you know, are the expectations really doesn't turn out to be that way. So a lot of these programs had a flexibility around uh, shifting priorities in their programming based on the community of men or male identified persons they were uh, engaging at the time. And then also um, incorporating a diverse spectrum of male identified facilitators as part of their programming. Um, one of the questions we asked, partic particularly for um, may, uh, programs that were what we identified as very heterocentric mainstream programs, we asked them, have, have, you, have any of your participants come out as gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer men? And most said no, but we get training on that. And, you know, we're, you know, and it goes that it goes back to that question of like, well, you know, we help all forms of men or male identified folks, you know, the, you know, we just don't understand why they're coming to us. Say, like, well, perhaps it's because you don't have folks who are representative. So there's something in the system and there's something in your organization that kind of is becoming a barrier. So again, one of the analysis of, of, from this report or the scan of the field is that having a diverse representation of male identity 
uh, as leaders, as male uh, or male-centered identities that are don't use violence, and you know, and showing positive uh, male identities around that spectrum. And they're peer-to-peer -peer models. Um, we know that the best model of any programming is just m participants taking care of each other and holding each other accountable. And for those of us who do facilitative work around, particularly around uh, batters intervention programming, we know that the best solution to anything is when other men in the, pro in the group call out other men or hold them accountable. So peer-to-peer -peer models, because again, there's a sense of community, and even I, as a man who are maybe helping facilitate the, the, pro the group or the project, I'm an outsider because I have certain privileges, I have a job, I have a career, I get paid to do this job, so it's questionable whether I'm here because I want to be or not. But when peer-to-peer, -peer, we know it works best, um, and it, so it results in better um, engagement from from male or, or uh, from man or male identified participants in, in these particular programs. So there was again some analysis around that, um, and so some of the recommendations that came about is. You know, we need, as always, increased research that focuses, again, from the perspective of Latino community on Latino men and boys, inclusive of gay, bisexual, transgender, queer Latino men. Um, future, future research should define the terms Hispanic and Latino men. Again, going back to terminology, um, you know, quite often we'll use word, terminology to kind of umbrella a different uh, racial or ethnic communities. So again, being more broader around that, and then increase research that applies a subgroup analysis technique, i.e. provide at least one or other cultural or racial identifier, language, generation status, nativity. Again, it's not just about focusing on the gender and the age and whether or not um, these men committed violence or not, which is important. But again, all these other things around language accessibility, um, the age, uh, and not just age, but also generational constructs of male or masculine identity and how that's embraced in their specific community. You know, are they also, were they born here? Were they not born here? Again, all of these things. And again, most of the models that we use currently that um, engage men primarily around batters intervention are from a very U.S. Western construct which not, may not be beneficial to men of diff, who may uh, be immigrant to this country or who may be uh, of, another, of, of a different racial or ethnic um, or even just language or even just geographically speaking. So being mindful of those uh, uh, situations. Um, Leo? Yes, and... and the, thanks for sharing all that information, um, Jose Juan. It's great to see all these um, recommendations that stem from research, uh, and we've been talking quite a bit about uh, theoretical frameworks. But the, um, so, so the big question is: so, how do we do this? How do we affect change? And we have to start somewhere. And and the the best point to me uh, to start on this, I learned from uh, um, some of the the best folks in the field that done this work in the past. So, yeah, uh, I had to mention a, uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Julia Perilla in a, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And she's a, uh, always a, um, mentioned that, you know, we can only affect change. We cannot make the change. We have to let people do the change. And how do we do that? Uh, from a philosophical standpoint, we have to uh, know what critical consciousness is, uh, which we call, we call it in Spanish uh, conscientización, and we that you know there's the uh, the definition that says refers to the process by which individuals apply critical thinking skills to examine their current situations, develop a deeper understanding of the concrete reality, and devise, implement, and evaluate solutions to the problem. That sounds great, but how how does that show up? How does that look? Well, it is simple. It could be as simple as, and I always give this example on how critical consciousness uh, shows up sometimes is uh, I grew up in a poor family in Argentina and uh, probably until I was, about, uh, I was about maybe seven or eight years old, I didn't realize that we were poor. And the moment that sort of like I realized that we were poor, that we didn't have things, 
sort of lit the fire under me that, oh, how do I get out of this? And <laughs> so, so that's, that's what I'm talking about. It's all about the aha moments. So how do we facilitate those aha moments? It's by, by providing, by, you know, making a change in our attitudes. Uh, we tend to, to, to go all the time to be a, we think that being a service provider is the model to follow or, you know, that we have to, you know, provide services to folks. And that's, you know, it, it was to a certain point, but it's sort of a, um, uh, that's not help with the big picture. And we have to change from that mentality to a mentality of being a team facilitator. We give folks all the tools and they make their own decisions. Uh, so yeah, that's why we think of this as a process and not an event. Otherwise, we get really, really uh, um, frustrated by the responses from folks. And and how do we ultimately do this is through community engagement. Um, we have to put in place the ideas that folks give us, not our own ideas. Sometimes our own ideas are not the best ideas. And and what we see, in a, especially in the Latino community, is that a, uh, when folks come up with their own ideas and those are solutions that the community thought about, that they were engaged, that they're part of it, that they have a, uh, opportunities in which they can participate. Those uh, are more long-lasting solutions and those are more uh, um, effective. So based on this, we have to ask ourselves, so how would the program engaging men in your community would look like? And we have to think of critical consciousness or conscientization. It's a, uh, we're not in charge. We need to uh, sort of give it up a little bit to the, <laughs> the word to the community. And we do that through community engagement, which is, that's the next slide. Jose? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, one of the principles of Casa Esperanza is community engagement. And so there's a difference between community engagement and community outreach, where we'll tease out the difference. Um, but, uh, you know, and there's actually we have an entire programming based around community engagement um and so Patti Toto Tinsley which is our CEO you know she says we don't have the right to define how this works how this work should happen we do have a right to work alongside our community and to really listen to what they need what they want and how they can help to make a difference and again um we do put it into practice you know every so often Casa Esperanza will hold listening sessions with community members to ask them, what do you want us to do? So one of the things I did not mention, um, Casa Esperanza, you know, national, the National Latino Network, Network is a project with Casa Esperanza. So, so Casa Esperanza, we still do direct services for survivors of family violence within Latino communities in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and so every so often we will hold community uh, listening sessions and we'll ask both the men and the women, what do you see we're doing good? What, are, what do you see we're not doing so good? Um, and again, that's how it's been part of how we've been able to, as an organization, uh, incorporate, engage men in the work around ender, ending gender-based violence. It's not perfect uh, because it's still very heteronormative in its context um but we are we do you know and we acknowledge that and we're and we're trying to address that but we do and firmly believe that it's around community engagement and, and and having community lead the conversation which sometimes can be very difficult for organizations because it's about but we've been around for 30 some years we know how to do our job it's like yes but if you're going to really be culturally responsive and then address that question as to why don't Latinos uh, access our services or why don't uh, African American or Black uh, communities access our services because there's something, you may have been around for 30 some years, but maybe it is work because it's just work for certain members of the community. So again, um, community engagement, and again, the term engage is popping up here, is like rooted in authentic relationships. Um, it is reciprocal, it is transformative, it is necessary. There's actually a video on YouTube around that we've, uh, that Casa Esperanza along with other community-based organizations developed to talk about community engagement. And so part of those uh, authentic relationships is really understanding what is our agenda as to why we're 
collaborating together um, and understanding that each member of that organization brings a different perspective, a different strength. Um, it is reciprocal in nature because it's not just a me, me, getting, getting, but also giving and sometimes even surrendering, if it's not too much of a strong word, to what other um, uh, compromises of other community members that we may not have or we think we're, we have. It is transformative in a way that is so incredibly powerful because once you once and again this, these are not easy to do this is not easy to do but um once you start engaging uh community you start realizing community will take over and take care of itself um because my 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 goal is to no longer to have a family and rape crisis centers in the country because once we have community empowered community to understand and, and heal each themselves, I mean, it really is that powerful. And then if we know that it's necessary. I know that I could not survive as, as a representative of Casa Esperanza without the support of community partners in, you know, whether in, they're in the housing program or they're in a, a, a daycare for children. You know, I know that community engagement <laughs> is important. And then sometimes community will teach us what, you know, what is best what we think we're doing is best for them, but really is not. So all of these four principles are so necessary as part of that. And then and the community at the work at Casa Esperanza, again, whether it's engaging men or male identified persons or engaging youth or engaging women survivors or just anyone as part of the community, is that community is at the core of everything that we do. Um, so how do we do it? <laughs> Um, you know, this means that we have to be able to, like you said, we have to be open to community criticizing um, the work that we do. And again, that's not easy. Um, one of the things that, one of the uh, technical assistance that we provided at the National Idea Network is we do a lot of organizational assessment with predominantly mainstream organizations who are having difficulties engaging Latino communities. Um, and it is a almost like a six month process. Um, there is a survey done, administered. It has an eight categories with several questions to it. And so, you know, it asks questions around racism and addressing all these things. And uh, it'll be administered depending on who the organization is to frontline people or direct service people, upper management, middle management. And then sometimes what results uh, back in the surveys is very challenging for leadership of that organization. And sometimes they just don't want to move forward. Some of them are like, you know what, we're going to do it. But again, at the core of community engagement is being open to that critique from those folks that we're trying to engage. Um, so this is something that kind of comes around community capacity, uh, putting the work into the hands of the community. So we look at individual, we look at the policy and social political because we, again, we don't, we don't, we, because we're grounded in community engagement, we also realize there's a reality to that process. And so we also acknowledge that there's an entire infrastructure that perhaps uh, imposes, like in this case, we're talking about men or masculinity, imposes certain things around what is to be a man or male identified person. And we, that, attached to policy and, and social political uh, processes, community and organizational, you know, um, connecting resources um, around men and ha help support men or male, ad male identified folks who are leaders in their community already. Um, that can, that also express a diversity of male identity as part of those communities. Um, family, again, this is very culturally relevant to Latino communities. Um, you know, um, but that is relevant to the support of those families and those family structures. Um, so when we are considering, for example, to do a program around youth or a parenting program, we actually, again, will go and check in with communities. Say, is this is our idea? What do you think? Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, and so 
as part of that, like we, I mentioned the uh, Tenvito toolkit. And so there was an entire process around um, interviewing not only women and women survivors, but also men who did not, uh, who, we, who they identified as not using violence in their relationship. And uh, Tenvito in, in English basically, basically translates to I invite you. And there's a reason why we chose that name for the for the toolkit. Um, and so when we the, it, when the research took place to interview these group of not, of men who identified as not using violence in their relationship but still impacted by it, is they acknowledged that gender violence or violence within the context of a family or intimate relationship is a social problem, right? Now you'll also notice that the term machismo is in there. But that's the word that these group of men from who identify from a diverse community of Latinos um, use to kind of frame male privilege. Because again, that's a term they understood and that's, that's a term I also understand as a Latino man. And so again, but it's within the context and framework of, the, of that community. Education, uh, these group of Latino men also understood that there needed to be more awareness in education at all levels, you know, at schools, friends, with family, around uh, violence in relationships or violence within families. They also understood there was a lack of support uh, for men, um, not just intervention for men who use violence in relationships, but just for men, you know, to have healthy sexuality, uh, fatherhood issues, um, you know, and, and uh, whatever else comes about that. And then family activities, you know, still, and this, again, this is very culturally responsive. Um, there is this image, even within Latinos, that, you know, men are not connected to their children, when in fact, yes, we are, <laughs> um, in very different ways. And of course, it's also generational. But um, again, incorporating the family as part of that support system, you know, um, you know, having social gatherings, having food at these social gatherings is very culturally responsive factor, part of that. Um, so they, they, these men understood it, um, they got it. And, and, and we would not have known that if we did not take the time to ask. And um, communities, but also to other men and male identified members of the community. So, you know, if you're a heterosexual male, how are you an ally to, to, to someone who may identify as a transgender male or bisexual male or, or a gay man? Um, and men need their own spaces, just like everyone else. You know, um, we need our own spaces to, to have conversation, to address certain things. Um, but again, this is, again, and I, the limitation to this um, research was from a very heteronormative, heteronormative perspective. But again, if we have a, if we start engaging a, a diverse representation of men or male identified persons, you know, we start kind of um, addressing those issues around, oh, men, there's this, or men, men are, are not that. Um, and so, Basically, um, the key message is invite men to participate. Um, uh, we do have a toolkit, and you can visit our website for folks who might be more interested in this particular toolkit. Um, it is very broad at the same time, um, and folks can are welcome to co-brand the, the materials with the organ with Casa Esperanza, the National Again Network. Um, but again, you know. We in, incorporated an evidence-based uh, research practice when we, were, when we were considering to engage men or just try to identify how to engage, in this case, Latino men in the conversation around ending gender-based violence. We took, but, the, but beyond that is we took the time to ask the community. You know, and you can coach it as using a research approach but the reality is we were just basically sitting around in a group with men and women and just having a conversation and just tapping into community and, and letting community tell us 
what they what should be the initiative for us when we're trying to engage men or male identified folks. Um, and so again, um, a lot of times why research again, you know, it's not just about determining the prevalence of domestic violence, but also looking at all these intersecting factors, as we've already mentioned, um, you know, um, attitudes, and, and you can you can use the term domestic violence, but at, Gus, at the Casa Esperanza National Latino Network, we also, we, we try to use the term gender-based violence because it incorporates a broader spectrum of the definition, and yes, domestic interpersonal violence falls under that. Um, as we mentioned, the intergenerational transmission of violence, but but from also from a more systemic uh, process of how violence is transmitted to communities. In this case, we're talking about men or male identified persons, how violence is used as part of our socialization and is transmitted from one generation to the next. You know, and you know, hyper masculinity is always also associated with using drugs and alcohol use, but that's also racial in context as well, um, financial factors, uh, cultural factors and gender norms as we've, as we've already talked about. Um, it's also about, not just about prevention, but also intervention. And again, framing it back from the context of our work is like, you know, community experiences, which are broad and varied. And also wanna remind folks that, you know, not all Latino communities are the same. Um, and so when this the the survey was done or the community uh, talks were done for the the Invito toolkit, we did focus groups in St. Paul, Minnesota, where Casa Esperanza is uh, at, and then we did two different places in in the country. I don't remember at this point. Um, and so what what to do? Learn more. You know, self reflect. Um, if anything, what part of this process is there's a lot of self-reflection happening, uh, not only from the part of the organization, which is so important, but also part of the community, a part of the men you, you may be trying to engage or male identified persons you're trying to engage. And that's difficult because we're in a society of results now, now, now. Well, no, that's not how it works. Um, if you really, truly want to really engage men, and not just invite them, um, it's having a, a process of self-reflection and what does that mean for you as an organization, uh, representation, all of that. Uh, be an ally to women and girls, um, but also being an ally to men, queer men, trans men, men of color, uh, poor men, all these folks, right? Um, and then, And then just not only to women and girls, but also women of color and girls of color, queer women, lesbian women, trans women of color, and so on. And just looking at that and being, and also again, self-reflecting on what an ally is in this process. Because if you help as other, as allies, if we help engage men, particularly nonviolent men to also engage violent men, we are actually creating a bigger access to, the, to this process. Um, again, influence other men to be a leader. Uh, this is a picture of my friend Emiliano Diaz de Leon. Um, he's, he, he's, uh, he's done a lot of work around engaging men. He's brave because he actually goes out and he challenges men. He calls out men um, on how to be an ally, how to be a leader um, without having to prescribe to the standard norms of what ma masculine leadership is. Um, and you can decide what that is, but I know for me, it means that um, I try to be a listener. Um, I try to um, explore um, the more what we have called feminine attributes, uh, you know, which listening, proactive listening is considered a feminine or a women attribute. Well, you know, if you don't know how to listen to other folks, how can you engage other folks? Um, and also have representing a different uh, model of what fatherhood, because he's an amazing father. He has, I think, his little boy is now six or seven years old, uh, doing an amazing job, but also acknowledging the challenges of raising a, a Latino or brown boy in this world. So 
dealing with those issues. And um, so he's not only representing men as a leader, male, quote unquote, but also as a father and trying to incorporate um, non-hyper-masculine, very gender-neutral kind of influences in, in his son, uh, which makes him no less of a man or no less of a male, but just a better human being. Um, and then be positive bystanders, you know, um, inviting, again, not just focusing on intervention programming, um, but look at fatherhood initiatives, look at healthy relationship initiatives, looking at uh, healthy sexuality initiatives as an inner, as a uh, prevention aspect of it. And prevention is a whole nother um, workshop in itself. Um, but those of you who work in, in the field of sexual assault or ending sexual violence, there's a lot of uh, training around prevention, and you can definitely reach out to um, the Colorado Coalition Against Sexual, Sexual Violence or Assault um, to help you with that. But it's, a, it's about not just focusing intervention, but also prevention and using peer models and all of, and all of those things. Um, and then part of that as men or male-identified persons is disclose our own histories of violence you know, because violence can be so subtle in how it, is, it filters through our process as men or male identified persons, um, either because like Leo said, we collude with it and we laugh and we remain silent, um, or we use uh, our male privilege in other ways to, um, whether we want to or not, um, increase gender-based violence. Um, Again, become a role model for boys, uh, all forms of, 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 of male identified boys, um, you know, not only our own sons, but also uh, neighbors, children, all of that, you know, just being a role model and what does that mean? Um, and showing connectedness among men and male identified persons. I'm not myself, I'm not a father, I don't have children, um, but what does that mean? You know, what can I do as a non parent person or a non-father person, how can I be a role model for young men and boys uh, to not to engage in, in gender-based violence? Um, and then, you know, supporting women's and girls' organizations, but beyond that, also supporting all kinds of organizations that are doing some type of social justice work. Um, because again, if we approach a intersectional framework to this work around ending gender-based violence, is that we also have to understand that, you know, people may be immigrant and the issues around anti-immigrant sentiment, um, you know, uh, people who may have disabilities, um, people who may be a limited English proficient, um, people who may identify as gender nonconforming or lesbian, or gay, bisexual, transgender, all of these things, right? Making it more expansive, um, you know, and, 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 and looking at ending gender-based violence from a very intersectional approach. Um, then share your work. Don't keep it to yourselves. If you've developed a model that works for you and you want to share it, share it. Don't be afraid. There is no secret. I mean, it, it, it is what it is, right? But just share the work. Um, you know, I shared a couple of programs through the RISE project that, you know, that, you know, that they're out there, um, but share the work, share what has worked for you all. Um, and then, you know, nuance it. It may not work universally for everybody, but, you know, if we communicate with each other and we share the work It you know, it's a less heavy burden for all of us. But again, it, it's, it, re it requires some trust. So just share the work. Uh, don't be afraid to share the work. Um, and again, just, just to remind folks that, you know, we do have the Tenvito Toolkit. Folks are welcome to look at it, uh, review it. If you have any questions, folks are definitely welcome to um, reach out to us. Um, and again, we've already mm -hmm. kind of talked about this because I'm looking at time here. Um, yeah, we only have a couple oh, minutes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so we'll just go through this very quickly, and you'll have copies of the um, 
of the PowerPoint. Leo? No, I just say, um, you know, a, um, uh, you know, the community engagement works just, you know, make sure that it's grounded in the community and that you give space to, for that to allow it to happen. So, but a, um, I know we only have a couple minutes, but the, uh, is there any questions that, that anybody had that, that we didn't address or something, maybe opportunities that you, uh, for future work or anything that you want to mention? We we cried when we created this PowerPoint. Uh, just a disclaimer: um, Leo and I created this PowerPoint is we wanted to come at come at come at it from a very conversational, very um, engaging process. Um, and certainly, folks may walk away without any specific answer, and that's okay. But I think uh, we just wanted to start the conversation and perhaps looking at the dialogue around root causes around what's preventing us from engaging men or male identified folks. Because again, this is an ongoing conversation. Um, yeah. And then every, everyone can reach to us. I think the, uh, the inform our information, our contact information is at the end of the PowerPoint. So you can reach out if you have any questions or if you uh, um, have something that you want to run by us, you know, a project or anything, we'll be glad to, uh, to help. I think we're done, Josh. Excellent. I'm not seeing any questions that have came through in the box. So I just want to thank you both for all of that great information. And once again, thank you to everyone who, who joined us today. Uh, keep an eye out for the follow-up email that will have a copy of the slides and link to our CCASA YouTube channel. And before I let everybody go, just wanted to mention CCASA's next webinar. It will be happening on November 28th at 12 p.m. It will look at the intersections between developmental di uh, disabilities and sexual violence. There will be a few more registration announcements that go out uh, between now and then. But if you haven't seen any of these, please just reach out to me at josh at ccasa.org and I can send you the link for registration. But I hope you all have a wonderful day and please remember to fill out the survey. Any last minute um, comments that either they want or Neil, you would like to make? No, I just want to uh, thank everybody that's joining us today. I appreciate uh, your time and commitment to this cause. Same here. Thank you. And thank you to the coalition, Josh, for inviting us to be here today. Thank you for providing all of this amazing information for us. Hope everybody has a wonderful day. Take care. Happy Friday. <laughs>